Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dean of the Clinton School of Public Service, Skip Rutherford, and Executive Director of the Clinton Foundation, Stephanie Street. Wow. You ought to look at this crowd. <laughs> For those here this evening and those watching via live stream and on C-SPAN, Stephanie and I welcome you to the Frank and Kula Compuris Distinguished Lecture Series. We would ask that you please silence your cell phones. A little activity there. Let me begin by first lifting up those who have been impacted and are dealing with Hurricane Dorian. If you are able, please consider supporting relief efforts. I'm Skip Rutherford, Dean of the Clinton School, and on behalf of the Compuris family, AT&T, the Clinton Foundation, and the Clinton School, we're glad you're here. Special thanks to Catherine Ann Compuris Trotter, Drew Compuris, and Dean Compuris for establishing this series honoring their parents. What a gift. And what a tribute to your mom and your dad. Just please know how grateful we are. I want to recognize the new class of Clinton School students. Stand up, guys. as well as our returning students, our faculty, our staff, and our very talented group of alumni right over there. Also joining us are Congressman French Hill, University of Arkansas System President Don Bobbitt and his wife Susan, Dr. Michael Moore, System Vice President for Academic Affairs, current and former members of the Board of Trustees, several members of the federal and state judiciary, the staff from the National Archives, many elected officials, including Little Rock Mayor Frank Scott, and guests from all over Arkansas and the region. We're pleased to welcome students from Philander Smith College and several other, and several other campuses, including the constitutional law class at UA Little Rock's Bowen School of Law. This event could not have happened without the long hours and hard work of the Clinton Foundation and Clinton School staffs, along with the support of many dedicated volunteers. Thank you all very, very much. A few months ago, I heard 10-year-old Anna Lee Castleberry of Batesville deliver a very personal and inspiring speech. In her remarks, she listed people she most admired, and in addition to her family members, she proudly said, and I quote, RBG. This evening, Annalie is here sitting with us as a salute to the many young people who are also inspired by Justice Ginsburg. Annalie, we're glad to have you here. Again, thank you all for joining us, and thank you, Compuris family, for making all this possible. Well, good evening. I'm also thrilled to be here with all of you at our largest Compurist Distinguished Lecture ever. We knew that Justice Ginsburg would draw a large crowd, larger than the center's great hall could hold. And we were right. We have enough people here tonight to fill 40 great halls. Thank you. 
As a young White House staffer, I had the honor of being in the Rose Garden on a very sunny day in June 1993, when President Clinton announced his nominee for the United States Supreme Court. Although I was somewhat familiar with Judge Ginsburg's accomplishments, she had already achieved so many firsts, I really wasn't prepared to be awestruck. Her remarks that day were poignant and powerful and have stayed with me all these years. As she was wrapping up, she thanked the many people who had helped her along the way. And she saved the last thank you for her mother, Cecilia Amster Bader. Justice Ginsburg describes her as the bravest and strongest person she had ever known. She said, and I quote, I pray that I may be all that she would have been had she lived in an age when women could aspire and achieve and daughters could be cherished as much as sons. Justice Ginsburg, I believe your mother would be very proud. You have accomplished so much. And you are cherished by so many. It is now my honor to introduce someone else who is cherished by so many of us. When selecting the site for his presidential center, President Clinton said one reason he chose his beloved home state was because he would have never become president without the support of the people from Arkansas. And as Congressman French Hill shared with a group of educators gathered at the Clinton Center last month, the Clinton Center has made a lasting educational and economic impact. It is the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> and 15 years after we opened our doors, the Clinton Presidential Center continues to give back to our community and our state. And I think this program tonight is a pretty good example. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the 40th and the 42nd governor of the great state of Arkansas, the 42nd president of the United States, and the founder of the Clinton Foundation, Bill Clinton! Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank Stephanie and Skip for the work they do at the Clinton Center and at the Clinton School of Public Service. I want to thank the Compuris family for sponsoring this lecture series. And thank you. I want to thank uh, I want to thank all of you. I, I tried to entertain Justice Ginsburg for a few moments before we came over here by telling her stories of my adventures and misadventures in Arkansas politics. <laughs> Back when we all thought of each other as people, as three-dimensional human beings before we realized we were just two-dimensional cartoons. And As is fairly well known now, I had not actually met Justice Ginsburg until that memorable Sunday evening in June of 1993, when she came to see me at the White House residence. I had already interviewed two other people, and it immediately leaked to the press. And you know, I had a lot of young aides, they worked hard and they were good people, but if a reporter called them, they were more afraid to say, I don't know, than anything else. So 
I got a big kick out of it. I sneaked who is now one of the most famous people in the entire world into the White House, and nobody knew. I'd been president for yes, less than a year, and I already had a Supreme Court appointment to make. I wanted to do a good job. Judge Ginsburg then was one of three people still in the running. They were all excellent candidates. And I carefully reviewed their resumes, but also their life stories. Hillary and a lot of other people had already told me I needed to take a hard look at Ruth Bader Ginsburg. They had ever met, actually, but Hillary had met her granddaughter because she went out and did a preschool event not long before I announced her appointment. And uh, she thought her granddaughter was a pretty good advertisement for her grandmother. <laughs> but she told me, you need to know about this person because you like people who have good life stories, who've actually lived what they say they believe. For those who haven't seen the recent films about her remarkable life, a very short version. She grew up in Brooklyn in a family of modest means. And as you heard Stephanie say, thanks to her mother's relentless early encouragement, she attended Cornell University and then Harvard Law, where she helped her husband and partner, Marty, through cancer treatment while simultaneously raising her daughter and working toward a degree. When he took a job in New York, she left Harvard. Now, that was a big sacrifice. There were then 500 people at Harvard Law School, and she was one of nine women. Today, today, most students in law school are women. After she graduated from law school, she went on to co-found the Women's Rights Project at the ACLU and began her career as a judge, still when the legal field was not particularly open to women. From the start of our first conversation in 1993, I got why so many people were hoping I'd appoint her. She was both brilliant and had a good head on her shoulders. She was rigorous but warm-hearted. She had a great sense of humor and a sensible, achievable judicial philosophy. She also kept the moral compass and the mental toughness that guided her from humble beginnings. I was so engrossed with her story when we were sitting there, and I just kept peppering her with questions, that I suddenly felt that I was really not interviewing somebody at, for the Supreme Court at all. I was just a guy talking to somebody that I really liked and that I hoped could be a part of our future. I had once taught constitutional law, and I knew how much the Supreme Court mattered. Even to people who didn't know it, I knew that it affects all Americans, sometimes very personally and deeply. I always thought a Supreme Court justice should have the heart, spirit, talent, discipline, knowledge, common sense, and wisdom to translate the hopes of the American people their legitimate desire for fair and equal treatment, and all the cases prevented to it into an enduring body of constitutional law that would preserve our most cherished values and still enable the American people to move forward. When I ran for president, I promised the American people that kind of justice. And I think I kept that promise. I appointed Justice Ginsburg for three reasons. First, 
she proved to be one of the nation's best judges on the bench. Progressive in outlook and judgment, balanced and fair in opinions. Second, she had a lifetime of pioneering work on behalf of women. And she had a truly historic record of achievement there. Before she was a judge, she argued six cases involving gender discrimination before the Supreme Court and won five of them. That's a better average than most people have. <laughs> Finally, I thought she had the ability to build common ground in a country that was already becoming increasingly polarized, to find a way whenever possible for the court to be an instrument of our common unity in their fidelity to the Constitution. She had already proved herself to be a healer. Time and again, her moral imagination had cooled the fires of her colleague discord and ensured that jurists kept their, rise, their right to dissent without entangling the court in endless animosities. In short, <laughs> I liked her and I believed in her. I just knew that she was the right person for the court. But I have to say, in the last 26 years, she has far exceeded even my expectations. She's written landmark opinions advancing gender equality, marriage equality, the rights of people with disabilities, the rights of immigrants. And she's almost as well known for her amazing dissenting opinions. In every case, she offers an alternative vision about how America ought to work for everybody, how it ought to be how votes ought to be counted, not discarded, how districts should be fair. I could go on and on. There's seven or eight of those dissents that I just read every now and then when I'm bored <laughs> and want to be reminded about why I still believe in America and the Constitution. Uh, but I have to say this. One thing I did not see coming when I nominated her, is her ascendance to pop culture icon. <laughs> her workout routine is marveled at. <laughs> Hillary got me a book, the RBG workout. <laughs> and she said, I bet you can't do it. I said, oh yeah, I can't. I'm just a kid, just 73, I can do this. I had to work out on my weight machine and do other stuff for two months before I could complete her workout. <laughs> Regularly, she's portrayed on Saturday Night Live delivering her blistering Ginsburns. <laughs> and now you can see her image and her quotes on t-shirts, tote bags, and coffee mugs the world over. You could become resentful of such a person. <laughs> but you're not. We like her because she seems so totally on the level in a world hungry for people who aren't trying to con you, who are on the level. She spent a lifetime trying to give other people from the get-go the opportunities she spent her early life struggling to reach. In one of her law review articles, she wrote, the greatest figures of the American judiciary have been independent thinking individuals with open but not empty minds, individuals willing to listen and learn, 
They have exhibited a readiness to re-examine their own premises, liberal or conservative, as thoroughly as those of others. She's lived her life doing that. And somehow, she also has found the time not only to attend just about every opera ever produced, but to actually appear on stage in some of them as well. Not very long ago, I had the honor of going to the University of Virginia to a special symposium on the presidency, and I said, it seems to me you could define the presidency of everyone who served by how they answered two questions connected to the oath of office. You have to promise to protect and uphold the Constitution. And those two questions can be found in the very first phrase of the prologue. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, the same thing could be said of Supreme Court justices. The two questions are, who's in we the people? And what does a more perfect union mean? I believe for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we the people is all of us. And I believe, that in her more perfect union, all of us on equal terms will be at home. She's gonna be interviewed tonight by NPR's remarkable legal affairs correspondent and I think we've reached a stage in our life when I could admit without hurting her career, one of my favorite journalists, <laughs> Nina Totenberg. Now, here's the last thing I want to say, and I am confident I speak for everyone in this vast arena. Only one person here appointed her, and one person, Senator David Pryor, voted for her. But all of us hope that she will stay on that court forever. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Justice Ginsburg and Nita Totenberg. Thank you, thank you. Please, be, everyone, please be seated. Please be seated. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. For coming. I think Justice Ginsburg and I have never, ever appeared before an audience this large before. <laughs> and uh, I understand that normally this is, I guess, recently the worldwide wrestling entertainment. We are not going to wrestle each other. <laughs> We're going to try to entertain you a bit and inform you. 
Um, you've heard President Clinton describing his, why he picked Justice Ginsburg. But I think I should start this interview asking you about that interview. Um, so let me set the stage. The year is 1993. The new president is flirting with all manner of potential Supreme Court nominations. And uh, the names keep getting leaked to the likes of me. Um, and behind the scenes, the inimitable Martin Ginsburg is doing everything in his power to promote his tiny but auspicious wife. Uh, and finally, you get a call from Bernie Nussbaum, the White House counsel. And it's a call that you had long hoped for, but you are in something of a fashion dilemma. So t tell us about how you got the call that day calling you to the White House and what your fashion dilemma was. <laughs> I was called on a Saturday in Vermont where I was to attend a wedding. <laughs> and um, Bernie Nussbaum said, the president wants to meet you please come back to DC. And I said, well, I've come all this way to attend the wedding. Can I come tomorrow morning? <laughs> and he said, fine, we'll go right from the airport to the White House. And I said, but I'll be wearing my traveling clothes. Well, that's okay because the, the president would be just coming off the golf course. So I arrive in my plain clothes and in comes a very handsome president wearing his Sunday best because he just come from church. So what was the conversation with the president like? What kinds of things did he ask? And did you have a good time or were you in interview agony? I didn't hear the name. Were you? Did you have a good time, or were oh, you in an interview ag time. agony? No, it, it was very easy to talk to the president. Um, we talked about constitutional law. After all, he was a constitutional law professor. We talked about family. Uh, we talked about many things, and I've had the experience with some men that they have certain discomfort talking to a, a woman. That was not that way with President Clinton. <laughs> so I was told after that interview by a number of White House aides that he just fell for you hook, line, and sinker. And this afternoon when we were talking, he said, in five minutes, I had just fallen for her hook, line, and sinker. Um, but when did you get the word? Do I recall that you got a call from Bernie Nussbaum when you were in the bathtub or something like that that night? It was rather late on Sunday night. And it, it was one of the happiest moments of my life. I was absolutely on cloud nine. And then the president said, and tomorrow morning we will have a little ceremony in the Rose Garden, and we'd like you to make a few remarks. So I had to come down from the cloud, <laughs> sit at my writing table. I liked the remarks. It was the only time in that entire episode when there was no time for White House handlers to go over what I was going to say. <laughs> so, my own words, unedited. You know, you then uh, went into a confirmation process. I think in the end you got, I'm not sure about this, I think there were only 
Ninety-six to three. Ninety-six to three. Thank you. Uh -huh. Uh, Republicans today all often cite the Ginsburg rule. And when I go back and I read the transcript, I read about what your rule was. But it strikes me that in light of modern confirmation hearings, more modern confirmation hearings, uh, nominees are considerably less responsive of all political stripes, not just Republican nominees. You actually answered questions about abortion and the death penalty and all kinds of things. The, the Ginsburg rule was that you, please do not ask a question that may come before the court because then I would have to disqualify myself if I gave an answer because a judge is not supposed to react just off the top of her head. When a question is presented to us, we read, first of all, the decisions that were written by the courts below, the trial court, court of appeals. And then we read the briefs that are anything but brief, <laughs> filed by the lawyers. And we read the relevant precedent. So to give an answer to a question without the benefit of all that reading and briefing is not what a judge could do. Still, there was a lot out there that I could be asked about because I was 17 years a law teacher, 13 years a judge on a court of appeals, so I'd written hundreds of, of opinions, many articles, and anything that I had already written was fair game. So you arrive at the court, you're the second woman, and Justice O'Connor had been there for 12 long years without you, right? What advice did she give you? She told me just enough to enable me to navigate those early weeks. She didn't douse me with a bucket full of information, just enough to get by. She was, I think, very pleased at a change the court made when I was appointed. Justice O'Connor was the lone woman on the court for 12 years. In our robing room, there is a bathroom, and it says men. For Justice O'Connor, when the need arose, she had to go all the way back to her chambers. When I came on board, they rushed a renovation. They created a women's bathroom equal in size to the men's. <laughs> Your first opinion assigned to you was not quite what you expected, and, and you went to her. Yes. The legend is that the new justice, the junior justice, will get a single issue case in which the court is unanimous. But Chief Justice Rehnquist gave me as my first assignment a miserable ERISA case. ERISA is the <laughs> Employee Retirement Security Act. It is one of the most complex statutes Congress ever wrote. The court was not unanimous, it divided six to three, and Justice O'Connor was on the other side. She was one of the three. So I came to her and I said, Sandra, he was not supposed to do that to me. <laughs> her response, and this is typical of Justice O'Connor, she said, Ruth, you just do it. Just do it. And get your opinion draft in circulation before he makes the next set of assignments. Otherwise, you will risk getting another miserable case. <laughs> I could never understand why 
lawyers that appeared before the court, who appeared before the court, and not uh, people who were not accustomed to the court, but some very seasoned lawyers, would get these two women mixed up. And Sandra Day O'Connor was about five, seven, or eight. You claim to be over five feet tall. <laughs> Uh, she was a Western ranch girl with a tw Western twang. You were a New Yorker, a Brooklyn girl. I don't know that it was a Brooklyn twang, but you were clearly an Easterner. Uh, she didn't wear her hair the way you do. Um, and still, people kept calling you Justice O'Connor and her Justice Ginsburg. Why? More, much more often, I was called Justice O'Connor. Well, the lawyers had learned there was a woman on the court, and her name was Justice O'Connor. So when they heard a woman's voice, it had to be Justice O'Connor. <laughs> and she would sometimes respond, I'm Justice O'Connor, she's Justice Ginsburg. There was a lot of attention paid to the two of us and how we interacted. And one day, I think it was in USA Today, there was a headline. The headline was, Rude Ruth Interrupts Sandra. <laughs> Sandra had asked a question, an argument. I thought she was finished. And she said, just a minute, I have follow-up questions. I apologized to her, and she said, Ruth, don't give it another thought. The guys do it to each other all the time. <laughs> there even was a T-shirt presented to the two of you, I think, by, I think it was the Radcliffe, somebody, some group of women from Radcliffe, and one side said, I'm Sandra, <laughs> I'm Sandra, not Ruth. It, it was the National Association of Women Judges. They had a reception for the two of us, and they gave her a T-shirt that said, I'm Sandra, not Ruth. Mine, I'm Ruth, not Sandra. <laughs> but if we can fast forward, I can tell you that doesn't happen anymore now that we are three. difference does it make? Hmm? What kind of a difference does it make to have three? Oh, one is the public perception. We have a line, a 10-minute line, often school children coming in and out of the court. And if they see three women, because of my seniority, I sit next to the chief. Justice Sotomayor is on one side, Justice Kagan on the other. So we're one third of the court, we're all over the bench. And as you will affirm, my sisters-in-law are not shrinking violets. <laughs> they, they are very active in the colloquy that goes on at, a, at an oral argument. For the years just, Justice Scalia was with us, there was kind of a competition between Justice Sotomayor and Justice Scalia, which one could ask the most questions <laughs> at our argument. You were um, the lone woman justice after Justice O'Connor retired. From, from 2006, I think, to 2000, pretty near the end of 2009. And I ha had the sense that you were not a very happy camper at that time. It was a lonely position. And viewing the court, there was something wrong with the picture. The public would see these eight rather well-fed men coming on the bench. <laughs> And then there was this rather small woman. <laughs> and did you find 
that even there on occasion, when you were just one, did you occasionally see that phenomenon of you say something and nothing happens and then 10 minutes later or five minutes later, one of your brethren says the same thing and everybody goes, oh, that's a very good idea. Well, that happened at conference uh, more, than, more than once. But I would make a comment, no reaction, then one of my male colleagues would say basically the same thing, and people would react. That's a good idea. Let's discuss it. It's a habit that had developed that you don't expect very much from the woman, so you kind of tune out when she speaks. But you listen when a male speaks. Now, I can tell you that that experience, which I had as a member of the law faculty, as a member of a court of appeals, now that I have two sisters-in-law, it doesn't happen. I'm going to pause here and ask you the question on, on people's minds. You've had a lot of serious threats to your health this year. Uh, you were operated on for lung cancer in December. Uh, you have just completed three weeks of radiation treatment for an additional cancer. So how are you feeling? And Excuse me, I, I'm really thrilled that we're here, but why are we here? You, you finished radiation treatment at the end of August. Yes. And, uh, August 23rd was the last, uh, was the last session. But I had promised the Clinton Library that I would be here and I just was not going to. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And I'm pleased to say that I am feeling very good tonight. <laughs> How do you keep going? I mean, you, you have, I took a ton of briefs with me on the plane here, and I managed about an hour and a half's worth, and then I was ready to, for a break. You do this when you're sometimes feeling really rotten in the last year. How do you keep going? I think my work is what saved me because instead of dwelling on my physical discomforts, if I have an opinion to write or I have a brief to read, I know it's, I've just got to get it done. And so I, have to get over it. Well, my, this is another instance where I got very good advice from Justice O'Connor. Justice O'Connor had a mastectomy and she was on the bench nine days after her surgery. She told me in my first cancer bout, it was colorectal cancer, Ruth, you schedule your chemotherapy for a Friday. Then you can get over it a Saturday and Sunday and be back in court on Monday. But you have done this really all of your life. Cancer is not a stranger to you. Your mother died the day before your graduation. 
Your husband was diagnosed with testicular cancer when you were both at Harvard Law School, and you had an 18 month or two year old child at the same time, and you're on law review. I think I often get Justice Ginsburg just to describe what a day in her life that awful year was like before Marty survived and beat the odds. We took it day by day. We always believed that we would, we would prevail, that we would beat the cancer. It was a, not an easy time. Um, after he had surgery, he had massive radiation because there was no chemotherapy in those days. So he would come home, be sick, go to sleep. He'd get up about 12, midnight, and um, whatever he ate for the day, he would eat then. He, then he would dictate his senior paper to me. I had no takers for all of his classes. My routine was I would go to my classes in the morning, go to the hospital in the afternoon, come home, play with my daughter who was then two. No, Jane was three. Um, put her to bed after dinner, which was at midnight. I would then go back to the books and prepare for, for the next day. So I was getting along on two hours of sleep a night for a week on end. But we always had a positive attitude that we would um, that we would live. So for your last year of law school, because Marty was a year ahead of you, you moved to New York to be with him for his job. Um, you graduated tied for first in your class at Columbia Law School, uh, but you couldn't get a job. You and Justice O'Connor used to talk about how lucky that was yes. in hindsight that you couldn't get jobs when you graduated at the tops of your respective classes. Well, that's an example of how something that may seem dreadful, very bad luck, turns out to be the most fortunate thing that ever happened to you. And Justice O'Connor put it this way. She said, suppose we had graduated from law school at a time when there was no discrimination, when women were welcome at the bar. What would we be today? We would be retired partners from some large law firm. But that route wasn't open to us, so we had to find another path, and that path led us to become Supreme Court justices. Um, you were recommended for all kinds of clerkships, Supreme Court clerkships, Court of Appeals clerkships. Nobody would interview you. None of these, because in those days they were all men, would, would interview you. You finally did get a clerkship back then, thanks to the rather assertive inter intervention of one of your professors, um, who basically said to your judge, the judge who hired you, if you take her and it doesn't work out, I have a guy who I'll send to you. He's at a, at a law firm now. But if you don't, I will never send you another Columbia grad. Um, so you went to work for Judge Palmieri, it ended up for two years, despite the fact that you had two strikes against you, where you were not only a woman, you were a mother. Um, but one of the charming stories of this period of your life is that one of the judges who turned you down and was not interested in you was Judge Learned Hand, a very famous, famous judge. 
And he turned you down because he said he couldn't swear in front of you. So, so you pick up the story from there. Judge Leonard had lived uh, one block uh, away from the judge for whom I clerked, Judge Palmieri. And Judge Palmieri often drove Learned Hand home. When I was finished in time, I would ride uptown with them, sitting in the back seat. And this great jurist would say anything that came into his head. Words that my mother never taught me. <laughs> and I asked him, you say you won't consider me as a clerk because you would have to censor your speech. And yet in this car, I don't seem to inhibit you at all. <laughs> and his response was, young lady, I am not looking at you. <laughs> um, for those of you who have not seen RBG or the biopic on the basis of sex, I recommend both. Uh, they pi provide a pretty good view of your career prior to becoming a judge and then later a Supreme Court justice. But what used to strike me when I covered your arguments uh, was how you had tailored your arguments. You had an all-male Supreme Court and you tailored your gender discrimination cases, the arguments in those cases, to appeal to different justices in different ways. And you often had male plaintiffs. Um, and one of those male plaintiffs was Stephen Weisenfeld, whose wife died in childbirth and who was denied social security benefits for his remaining, his child who survived, even though his wife was the principal breadwinner. And you won, but there were basically three arguments that succeeded. And I wanted you to talk about each how each group of justices saw it. First, let me tell the audience how Stephen Weisenfeld came to my attention. He had written a letter to the editor to his local paper in Edison, New Jersey. And he said, I've been hearing a lot these days about women's lib. Let me tell you my story. My wife died of an em embolism just after our son was born. And I knew that there were benefits available to a sole surviving parent who had a young child to take care of. So I went to the Social Security office to claim those benefits, and I was told, we're very sorry, Mr. Weisenfeld. These are mother's benefits. They're not available to fathers. Now, it was obvious to me that although the plaintiff was a man, the discrimination was against the woman as wage earner she paid the same social security taxes that a man would pay, but her contributions did not net for her family the same protection. So I think it was the dominant view of the court that this was really discrimination against the woman as wage earner. A few of the justices said, no, it's discrimination against the male as parent. He doesn't have the option to personally care for his child. Under the Social Security, you could earn a certain amount and still get the Social Security benefits. If you earned over the limit, the benefits would be reduced dollar for dollar. And Weisenfeld had figured out, I can do part-time work, earn a certain amount, and keep those benefits. So. Some of the justices said it's obvious 
for this discrimination against the male as parent. He has no choice but to work full time. He doesn't have the option to care personally for his newborn. And then there was one who later became my chief, then Justice Rehnquist, who said, it's totally arbitrary from the point of view of the baby. Why should the baby have the opportunity for the care of a sole surviving parent only if that parent is female and not if the parent is male? So it was such a wonderful illustration of how gender-based discrimination hurts everyone, hurts women, hurts men, and children. There was a case that you had that you wanted to take to the Supreme Court, but you couldn't because the case involving the, I think, Army or Air Force uh, pregnant woman. The Susan Strzok case. Yes. Yes. I had hoped that that would be the first reproductive choice case that the court would hear. The case arose in 1971 when Captain Strzok was serving in the Air Force. And she was serving abroad when she became pregnant. Pregnancy in those days was a mandatory ground for discharge. The base commander said to her, 1971, two years before Roe v. Wade, you can have an abortion on base. We provide those for women in service and wives of men in service. And if you do, you can remain in the Air Force. But if you choose to go through the pregnancy, you are discharged, no exceptions. Susan Strzok said, I'm a Roman Catholic, I cannot have an abortion, but I've made arrangements to have the child adopted at birth. I will cost the uh, taxpayers nothing because I'll use only my accumulated leave time for the birth. And she said, you know, here we are at Clark Air Force Base where some of my male colleagues get hooked on alcohol or on drugs. And you don't mandate their discharge. If they report themselves, they can be in a rehabilitation program, and you will keep them for much longer than the time I'm going to take off for this birth. Doesn't make any sense. Pregnancy is a ground, a mandatory ground for discharge, and that was that. Uh, Susan Strzok brought her case in a federal district court. She lost there. Oh, by the way, she was very well represented, so she got a stay of her discharge every month. So she was always in, fighting to stay in, not out trying to get back in. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she um, she won in the district court. She, in, in, what happened? Then, then it went to the court of appeals. She lost again, but there was a very good dissenting opinion. And then I wrote a petition to the Supreme Court to hear her case. The Supreme Court said. Yes, we'll take it. And then the Solicitor General at the time, who had been dean of the law school I first attended, he asked to have a meeting with the top military people and said, 
this case has lost potential for the government. You should waive Captain Strzok's discharge and then change the rule prospectively so that pregnancy is no longer an automatic uh, discharge. And, and the Air Force did. And then immediately the government moved to have the case return to the Court of Appeals for determination whether it was moot, no longer alive because she got all the relief she was seeking. She remained an Air Force officer. So I called Captain Strzok and said, is there anything you're missing so that we can claim this case is still alive? And she said, well, I have all my pay and allowances, so nothing there, but there is one thing. And this conversation is going on now in 1972. She said, all my life, I've dreamed of becoming a pilot, but the Air Force doesn't give flight training to women. And then we laughed because we knew in 1972 it was much too early. It was still an impossible dream to win that case. And the difference between then and now is one of the reasons why I am optimistic about the future. Today, it would be unthinkable to deny flight training to women. Justice Ginsburg, this may be a little uh, too thinky, but I think it's important to talk about. Um, and that is the notion of originalism versus a living constitution. A majority of the current court believes to one degree or another in the notion that justices should interpret the constitution as it was meant by the founding fathers when it was written in the late 1700s. That the original intent is what matters and the text as it was written and what it was intended. You and most of the justices you have served with, at least until now, have a somewhat different take. That the Constitution was written to be elastic enough, as Justice Kennedy, now retired, put it, to accommodate changes in society. Could you talk about your thinking a bit? Um, President Clinton said it so well in his introduction. Our Constitution begins with the words, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. So think how things were in 1787. Who were we the people? Certainly not people who were held in human bondage because the original Constitution <laughs> preserved slavery. And certainly not women, whatever their color. And not even men who own no property. So it was a rather elite group, we the people. But I think the genius of our Constitution is what Justice Thurgood Marshall said. He said he doesn't celebrate the original Constitution, but he does celebrate what the Constitution has become now over, well, over two, you know, well over two centuries. And that is the concept of we the people has become ever more inclusive. So people who were left out at the beginning, slaves, women, men without property, Native Americans were not part of we the people. Now all the, once left out people are part of our political 
constituency. And we are certainly a more perfect union as a result of that. Uh, the Constitution, the original Constitution, preserved the slave trade till 1808. Uh, one of the provisions that's an embarrassment is the Fugitive Slave Clause that said, if someone held as a slave escapes into a free state and the master asks to get the slave back, the slave must be returned to the master. That fugitive slave clause is in Article 4 of the Constitution, where you can still read it today, but there'll be a star next to it saying, changed by the 14th Amendment, which says, You know, when I, the first time I met uh, Justice Ginsburg, it was by phone, and we were both quite young women, compared to now anyway. And I was a brand new Supreme Court reporter reading about the first case claiming that discrimination against women was a violation of the 14th Amendment, the first case in the Supreme Court. And it was the, ultimately the case that the court first said that it was a violation of the 14th Amendment. And I didn't understand it. And I, because I said, you know, the 14th Amendment was enacted to cover uh, slaves and African Americans and it doesn't say anything about women. And I called you up and you gave me an hour long lecture, but I'm gonna ask you for a <laughs> 60 second version. <laughs> But you, you said, I thought the 14th Amendment was about race. Yes. And I said, yes, it certainly is about race. But the 14th Amendment reads, nor shall any state deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. No, the, the first time the Supreme Court heard such an argument was in the 1870s. <laughs> a, a, a woman uh, wanted to vote. And she said she was stopped at the polls. And she said, now I read the Constitution and it says, no shall any state deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. The court's response to her was, you are indeed a person, and you are a citizen of the United States, but so too are children. And no one would suggest that children should have the right to vote. The court has come a long way since then. The turning point case that you asked me about was called Read Me Read. It was about Sally Reed, who had a great tragedy in her life. She had a son. She and her husband divorced. When the boy was young, the legal term is of tender years, Sally was appointed custodian of the child. When the boy reached his teens, the father went to the family court and, and said, now he needs to be prepared for a man's world, so I should be the custodian. Sally fought that. She thought it was, uh, would not be good for her, her son to live in his father's home, but she lost. Sadly, she turned out to be right. The boy was sorely depressed. And one day, he took out one of his father's many guns and committed suicide. 
So Sally wanted to be appointed administrator of his estate to take care of whatever he left behind, which was precious little, a small bank account, a guitar, some records, that was about it. And she applied. Her former husband applied two weeks later. And the probate court judge said to Sally, I'm sorry, but the law gives me no choice. It reads, this, is, this was the law of the state of Idaho, as between persons equally entitled to administer a decedent's estate, equally entitled, males must be preferred to females. And the thing about Sally Reed is she was an everyday woman she made her living by caring for elderly or uh, disabled people in her home. But she thought an injustice had been done to her. And she also believed that our legal system would right that wrong. So on her own dime, she took the case through three levels of the Idaho court courts, and then I got involved in the case and wrote the brief for her Supreme Court case. She prevailed with a unanimous decision. It was the first time, the case was decided in November 1971, first time in history that the Supreme Court ever held a gender-based classification unconstitutional. And, and then after that 1971 precedent, we were on a roll, case after case, challenging gender-based classifications. And you can see on the basis of sex and understand more, and RBG and understand yet more. So speaking of children for a moment, I want to sort of lighten this up before I close with some conversation about your late great friend Justice Scalia and your relationship with him. But first, could I get you to tell the story of the elevator thief? Oh, the elevator thief was my then, let's see how old was James E. Must have been 11, my, my son. Uh, my son was a lively child. <laughs> I called him lively, but his teachers called him hyperactive. His school had a hand-operated elevator. The elevator operator went out to smoke a cigarette, and one of my son's classmates dared him to take the kindergartners from the ground floor up to the top floor. <laughs> so my son did that, and he was greeted by three stone faces, the room teacher, the school principal, and the school psychologist. <laughs> and I was called, I was getting calls about once a month to come down to the school to hear about my son's latest escapade. Well, one day I was in my office at Columbia Law School and feeling particularly weary because I'd stayed up all night writing a brief. And I said, to the caller, this child has two parents. Please alternate calls. <laughs> and and it's, his, it's his father's turn. <laughs> so, and Marty, my husband, went down to the school and was told, your son stole the elevator. <laughs> and my husband, who had a wonderful sense of humor, said, hmm, so he stole the elevator. How far could he take it? <laughs> now, I don't know if it was Marty's sense of humor. I suspect it was that the school was 
very hesitant to take a man away from his work. There was no quick change in my son's behavior, but the calls came barely once a term <laughs> because I had to think twice <laughs> before calling a man away from his work. You and the late Justice Scalia used to spar incessantly about this whole su the whole subject of originalism versus a living constitution and textualism. But you were great friends for many decades. You served on the same court of appeals. You'd known each other even, I think, at the University of Chicago briefly. Um, so let me you know, start with that personal friendship. People seem always so surprised that Justice Scalia, this iconic conservative, uh, and Justice Ginsburg, this iconic feminist, were such good friends. So, and I know that you really loved him. So what did you love about him? He had a marvelous sense of humor. When we were on the Court of Appeals together, the Court of Appeals has three judges, and he would sit next to me, and he'd whisper something during the argument that absolutely cracked me up, and I had all I could do to avoid bursting out into hysterical laughter. And one thing that we com had in common, we were both worked very hard on our opinions. We, we tried to write them so at least judges and other lawyers and hopefully a larger public could understand what we were saying. Justice Scalia was the son of a, a, a Latin professor at Brooklyn College and his mother was a grade school teacher so he was an expert grammarian he would sometimes come to my chambers or call me and say, Ruth, you made a grammatical error. I don't want to embarrass you by sending you a note that would be circulated to all of our colleagues, but you should fix this up. <laughs> and I would call him and say, you know, this opinion is so strident, you're not going to be as persuasive as you would be if you would tone it down. He never, never took that advice. We, we also uh, really, really cared about family. We spent every New Year's together as the two couples, plus as many, he had many more children than I did, but whatever children wanted to come along. And uh, Justice Scalia and I uh, shared a passion for opera. So we were supers, extras, um, in a couple of opera performances the Washington National Opera. Um, Am I making this up, or did you sit on his lap in one of those? No, the soprano sat on his lap. <laughs> so he knew that she was going to end the song on his lap, but he, what he didn't know was that she was going to throw her arms around him and give him a big kiss. <laughs> <laughs> and you travel together. There's a, a very funny picture in your chambers the two of you on a... Uh, we, we traveled to India uh, for a judicial exchange, and the two of us broke away from the pack for a couple of days, and we went to Rajasthan and to Agra. And there was a famous picture where in the Ramba Palace in Rajasthan, a very beautiful... Uh, it was the... It was the palace of the last Maharaja of Rajasthan. So there was a very elegant elephant, very beautifully painted elephant. And we were taking a ride on the elephant, and I'm sitting in the back, and Scalia is in the front, and my feminist friend said, Horace, what are you doing sitting in the back of the elephant? And I explained it had to do with the distribution of weight. <laughs> there is an opera 
as you would expect, a comic opera about the two of us. It's called Scalia Ginsburg. Again, why is Scalia first? Because in our workplace, seniority really counts, <laughs> and he was appointed some years before I was. So the, the opera tries to portray the difference between us, and Scalia's opening aria is a rage aria. It goes like this. The justices are blind. How can they possibly spout this? The Constitution says absolutely nothing about this. And then I answer, dear Justice Scalia, Oh, but you come in through a glass ceiling. Oh, that's later. Oh, that's later? This is it. Sorry. This, I screwed up the story. This is the beginning. We set up um, the different ways we approach a legal text. I said, you're searching for a bright line solution to problems that don't have easy answers. But the great thing about our Constitution is that like our society, it can evolve. And then there's kind of a jazz riff with uh, let it grow, let it grow. <laughs> the, the plot is um, roughly based on the magic flute. Justice Scalia is locked in a dark room. He is being punished for excessive dissenting. And that's when I enter through a glass ceiling <laughs> to help him pass the tests he needs to pass to get out of the dark room. <laughs> then a character called the Commentatore, who is borrowed from Don Giovanni, uh, is appalled. He said, why would you want to help him? He's your enemy. And I explained, he's not my enemy. He's my dear friend. And then we sing a wonderful duet. It's titled, We Are Different, We Are One. Different in our approach to reading a legal text, but one in our reverence for the Constitution and for the institution we serve. Well, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, dear notorious one, we thank you for a wonderful evening. Now, I think there's some closing remarks, and everybody's coming up here extremely slowly. So we have to. We have to tap dance until they get here. Okay. <laughs> well, this has been a pretty spectacular program. I hope you'll help me thank our host, President Clinton. Thank you, President Clinton, for putting the Clinton Center in Arkansas so we can have programs like this. Do you agree? Please help me thank our terrific moderator, Nina Totenberg. And of course, the remarkable, the notorious RBG, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> On behalf of the Clinton Foundation, the Clinton School of Public Service, 
Thanks to all of you who joined us here, who watched us online, and we hope to see you at the Clinton Presidential Center very soon. Good night.